I'm sure it's been an exciting uh, three weeks. Um, on my last count, I counted 1,249 pictures being shared on Facebook and Flickr. <laughs> <laughs> wow. from, um, from this um, fellowship. Uh, that's quite interesting, right? And that's technology for you. And I'm sure uh, 11 years ago, when this fellowship started, uh, perhaps some of you, if you were there, would have to get back to your country and wait for your pictures, for you to get those pictures. So that's yeah. what technology has done. But there are this set of people, I call them uh, the bottom 80 million in Nigeria. So <laughs> this is where they live. This is where they stay. And they are not only in Nigeria, they cut across the northern part of West Africa. And yes, uh, so this conversation always goes like, oh, OK, so it seems with my colleague, who is a co-founder of my organization, like, oh, it seems Silicon Valley is so far from us. Uh, Nigeria is a country of about 160 million. 60% uh, stay in rural communities. 40% uh, are in the urban center. But even those that are, that are referred to as staying in urban centers, uh, I wouldn't call it urban center because they live, uh, I'm very sure that their per pay per income would not be as those people living on the high streets that we saw uh, while touring San Francisco. So um, the curious case of my life. Um, so I grew up um, in a suburban uh, part of Lagos State, um, where when ambassadors from other countries come into the country, they don't go there. They can't come there. Where when UN advisory missions, when they come to Nigeria, they would never want to go there. Where my own president would not even want to go to, and the governor of the state as well will never want to go there. So uh, my parents do um, take me to our home country, where they were born as well, um, which is another city just quite close to Lagos, a very rural community. And uh, this thing struck me like, so why is the difference between people staying in this community and we staying in the suburban? and those staying in the main city. Uh, there's a place they call Victoria Island in Lagos, which is where you see UN missions ambassadors do go to whenever they come to Lagos. Uh, this keeps ringing in my mind every time I go back, go to school, walk through uh, or pass through Victoria Island until, yeah, I moved away from Lagos. I went to Port Harcourt, which is where you have the art of oil in Nigeria. While working in Port Harcourt, I saw the same thing, even where the wealth of Nigeria comes from. Uh, that state contributes about 30% of the GDP of Nigeria. Um, so it became so displeasing to me. Like, so what are we going to do about what can we do? How can you help these people? And the only thing my parents do tell me is, well, you're learned, you're in school, you're going, you're going to be graduated, the only thing we can tell you is that you are privileged. Just like every one of you sitting here, you're privileged. And because you're privileged, uh, you have some tools that you can use in catering for those people. Uh, Nigeria, uh, in Nigeria, the, uh, the average budget for the past four years has been 20 billion US dollars. Uh, the state, each state has an average of about uh, 500 million US dollars. While looking at all this, I felt, how come we still have people yearning for infrastructures, for schools, for good water in these communities? And don't forget, there are about 80 uh, million of them. I call them the bottom 80 million. And uh, just to fast forward, in 2012, uh, this came on the headline, uh, time running out for poison kids. There are about 1,500 lead poison children in a community called Bagega. 
And this, uh, this was a story done by one of my friends, Eda Mudok, of the Voice of America, while we visited the community. We were invited by Doctors Without Borders to come and see ourselves what's happening and think about what we can do with the knowledge we have in the country and get these kids. Yes, the government has promised several times since 2010 that, oh, we've been releasing funds, millions of dollars uh, to this community. But in 2012, what we did was at first, I called my colleague and I was thinking about how we can use um, our data, data mining, uh, to uh, give a voice to these people. We had to look at all the data, found out that there were uh, about 5.3 million was just released by the president. Ground truthing was we going to the community all the time. And we had to engage the community as well. So it's not just like we go on Twitter and start tweeting. No, because this will be so emotional. It has to be a very emotional story. Uh, fortunately, we had Human Rights Watch as well, which came into the country just before that. Uh, we had a campaign. So we, also, we always do offline advocacy, which is the one that's quite dear to us, using uh, several media, uh, traditional media, that's the newsprints, um, the radio, most importantly. Then we have online advocacy, Twitter and Facebook. What we found out was that the president of Nigeria then was the fourth highest follower, as the fourth highest follower on Twitter in the country. So what we did was to do Twitter tones that direct messages to, uh, uh, to his handle. And also for Facebook, uh, with uh, partnership with Human Rights Watch, we asked people to start writing on his Facebook page that, what are you doing with these uh, kids? When are you going to provide the funds for these kids? Eventually, uh, funds were provided. But we had to track it because it's not all about providing the funds. You have to make sure things are working within the community. Uh, in 24 hours, the government responded uh, when we did a Twitter thon on Facebook, and they provided funds for that community. But we kept on doing the community engagement part and not waiting for anybody. In 2013, all the 1,500 children were treated by Doctors Without Borders. But there are still some other stories. You think you have technology, you have mobile phones, you have Twitter, you have Facebook. Do you think this is going to help this bottom 80 million? Because right now, they feel they're far away from Silicon Valley. And them being far away from the Silicon Valley means that people like us, people like you sitting around the table, need to find a way to connect the dots, which is our own ideology in our organization, connected development. Uh, at Follow the Money, what we do is, yes, use those tools that are available. And we, as intermediaries that do have local knowledge, we feel that open data alone will not solve the problem. Technology alone will not solve the problem. Community engagement alone will not solve it. But if we can combine these three, technology, these three uh, things together, yes, we will see lots of successes. And the success story still keep on continuing. Um, I can say a whole lot, but it's at Follow the Money NG. Dot org. Uh, if you feel you want to start it in your own community, in, in your own society, feel free to just uh, get at us. And yeah, we can still continue to learn. And because we are still learning and unlearning, uh, we, have our, uh, we have our breakdowns at times with some of the projects we do. At times, we're successful and we're happy, but we still keep on learning. Thank you very much. Very